Well, good afternoon or good night or good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Um, we're very pleased to uh, be presenting here another in the series hosted by CMSA at Harvard on the history and development of mathematics. And today we're really delighted that Ciprian Manolescu has agreed to give a talk. Uh, he's joining us virtually from Stanford and uh, he's going to be giving us a survey of um, the history of four-dimensional topology. Um, you may ask questions during the talk, but there'll be also opportunity at the very end uh, for, for a question and answer. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, should we say anything about how people can ask questions? Uh, so th there are two ways you can uh, uh, either write them in the uh, in the chat or in the Q&A. And um, yes, I will uh, try to answer during the talk or at the end. Okay, uh, should I get started? Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will be talking about the history of four-dimensional topology. Uh, I wanted to first make some disclaimers. Uh, I wasn't around when many of the developments I will mention were happening. So I may get some things wrong, in particular the chronology, like the years. Some results were published several years after they were discovered. So all dates are meant to be approximate. And um, like any history, it's uh, necessarily incomplete. Uh, I apologize if I uh, omit some important results. And uh, of course, it's, um, it's biased in terms of my own interests, um, but I try to um, mention um, the, the results that, um, yeah, that I think uh, were the most important. Okay, so the way I organized the, the talk is uh, in four parts. Um, first um, was what was known about four-dimensional manifolds before 1981. Second was, um, second is um, 1981, 1982, when there were two main discoveries, one by Friedman and one by Donaldson. And this really shaped how the subject um, developed since then. And I will talk about the immediate consequences, I mean, in, in the next the decade until, let's say, 1994. In 1994, there was another revolution. Uh, cyborg wind theory came about. And uh, the third part of the talk, will, uh, I will discuss um, um, what came out of cyborg wind theory in the um, next six years until 2000. And then finally, uh, the fourth part of the talk will be the last 20 years uh, since 2000. This is the part that I'm most familiar uh, with. Uh, and um, in particular, it was marked by the development of FLIR homology. So I will mention that. And at the end, I will also discuss some um, results coming from a different tool, Kovano homology, and some hopes for the future. Okay, so let's start with the first part before 1981. So that's the prehistory of the subject. Well, the first thing that came um, in terms of four dimensional manifolds were examples. It's like you can think of simple four manifolds like CP2, S2 times S2 and so on. And many of these, I mean, a, a big number of examples uh, can be obtained from algebraic geometry as uh, complex projective surfaces or more generally from complex geometry as complex surfaces. And there is a classification scheme for these things. Um, this was um, for in the algebraic case, this was done by Enriquez uh, in 1914 following work of Noether and other people and then Kodaira um, in or in the 60s uh, extended it to uh, complex surfaces. So in their classification, there's 10 types of complex surfaces, uh, which are listed here. Um, it's a bit of a lie to say it's a classification. The, the type that's uh, most general are the sorts of so-called surfaces of general type. The other nine types can 
um, you can find a list for them, but um, for general type, you don't really have a list, but you have um, many examples and much is understood about them. So for example, there is this um, drawing, which I got from Wikipedia, explaining how the different kinds of surfaces fit um, in, uh, with respect to their characteristic numbers, namely the second churn class is on one coordinate and uh, C1 squared, the first churn class squared is on the second coordinate and yes, what, what these surfaces, uh, where they can live. Um, for, for surfaces of general type, for example, it is known that they live between these two uh, lines, the Nether inequality line and the uh, Bogomolov, Miyoka, Yao inequality. All right, so we have lots of examples coming from algebraic and complex geometry. Now, there are also other kinds of examples. You can get them from surgery construction. For, uh, so for instance, you can find a smooth closed four dimensional manifold with any fundamental group you want. And um, so the construction of this is if you have a finite presentation of a group, you, could, you take the connected sum of S1 times S3 uh, with one term per generator. And then, uh, well, at that point, the fundamental group is the free group on um, how, however many generators you have. And then you impose relations. And for that, you do what's called surgery on loops. You replace a neighborhood of the loop with, um, which is S1 times P3 with B2 times S2. Um, now, this gives some interesting um, result. Uh, one thing that's known from different parts of mathematics is that there is no algorithm that uh, can be applied to finite group presentation to tell you if they give you the trivial group. So in other words, there's no way of classifying finitely presented groups. This is a theorem of Adian and Rabin from 1955. And it has an implication in four dimensional topology based on constructing, I mean, you can construct uh, four manifolds with the given group. And by working a little <coughs> bit more, what you get is this theorem of, Mar of Markov from 1960, that there is no algorithm that can tell whether two arbitrary closed four manifolds are diffeomorphic. Okay, so in other words, you can't really hope to give a classification scheme for all four manifolds, just like you cannot do it for groups. In view of these, uh, what people do in practice is focus on four manifolds with a specific fundamental group. You can, and typically you just ask for them to be simply connected and that's already a difficult enough problem. Sometimes you can consider fundamental group equal to Z or Z mod two or some other group of your choice. But we're mostly gonna talk about simply connected four manifolds. Uh, okay, Professor, there is a question. Yes. Okay, so uh, let me unmute. Yevgeny? Yes. What is your question? I mean, is there an algorithm? Is that dual abstraction to the being an algorithm? In other words, if you have you know, given two manifolds and then the isomorphism between the fundamental groups, is that can there be an algorithm to determine that, or what's the size of that question? I'm sorry. Can, can you repeat like, the questions? Uh, maybe it's better not. if you write it in the Q and A. I mean. If you given two manifolds with the same fundamental group, is yes. what oh, is, is there an algorithm question? for for uh, for figuring out if they are uh, diffeomorphic? Uh, no, not that I know of, but I don't think uh, okay. this is proved either. But yeah, I mean, uh, the, there are actual examples of manifolds for which we don't know if they are diffeomorphic. We just don't know. Good question. 
Oh, someone also asked if this is special to four manifolds. It's, uh, well, it's special to four manifolds and higher, like five, six, and so on. Uh, that there's also no algorithm for those. In dimension three, there is a, uh, an algorithm for recognition. Okay, let's move on to this simply connected four manifolds. Um, so, okay, wh what can we say about simply connected four manifolds? We can first look at their um, invariants. Uh, there's um, the homology, so homology H1 and H3 is zero by Poincare duality. Uh, and H2, you can prove it's, uh, it's a free group, uh, well, free abelian group with B generators. And then you also have the intersection form, which is a symmetric uh, unimodular, meaning determinant plus or minus one by linear form on ZB. Okay, so one theorem, uh, which uh, was stated by Milner, but based on previous work of Whitehead, is that the intersection form determines the homotopy type of X. Uh, if, if it's a simply connected four manifold. Um, and so when you want to classify four manifolds, you can ask up to homeomorphism, diffeomorphism for smooth ones, especially up to diffeomorphism. But if you just care about homotopy equivalence, then the intersection form tells you everything. Now, what intersections forms can we have? Well, if you work over R, if you just think of it as a symmetric matrix over R, then you can split this bilinear form into a bunch of ones and a bunch of minus ones. And then how many you have, this is called, um, these are usually denoted B2 plus and B2 minus of uh, the four manifold. And you can re-express them if you want in terms of the signature and the Euler characteristic of the manifold. So the signature is the difference, how many positive minus negative eigenvalues you have. And, this, uh, and the Euler characteristic, well, you get two from H0 and H4, and then plus B2 plus and B2 minus. So in other words, over R, Q is determined by, the, by two quantities. However, uh, the intersection form is really over Z, and over Z from algebra, the classification is more complicated. Uh, it depends whether the form is indefinite or definite. Um, if it's indefinite, so meaning that both B2 plus and B2 minus are non-zero, uh, there are two um, cases. It can either be some a direct sum of copies of one and minus one, or a direct sum of copies of zero, one, one, zero, and E8. I will write what E8 is on the next slide. The first case is called odd and the second case is called even. I will also mention what even means in a moment. But there's a simple classification in the indefinite case. In the definite case, it's more complicated. There's of course diagonal matrices, but um, also there are non-diagonal like E8, E8 plus E8, the Leach lattice and so on. And again, there's many of them. There's no simple way of listing them. Uh, here's E8, by E8 I mean this matrix, uh, and you can think of it as the adjacency matrix of the graph on the right of the E8 Dinkin diagram. Uh, and I promised I would say what even is, so a um, bilinear form like this is E over Z is even if um, when you take Q of A and A, that's always even and it's called odd otherwise. If it is even, you can prove from algebra that the rank is divisible by eight. So the typical example is the E8 form. Now here is um, a very important result that's specific to four manifolds. And it tells us that not all of these bilinear forms can be represented by, four, by smooth four manifolds. Namely, if you have a smooth closed spin four manifold and the spin condition in the simply connected case just means that QX is even, then Rochlin proved that the signature of X is divisible by 16. So not just by eight, 
but um, but by 16 and let's um, let's go back for a second um, so if we look at the even case we have uh, oh by, by the way I oh sorry I made a mistake uh, what did I say I want I meant the signature is divisible by eight not the rank is divisible by eight sorry so so uh, one even case is this m0110 plus n e8 the signature of that is eight times is eight n uh, and the second even case are some of these definite matrices like E8 or E8 plus E8. E8 has signature 8. E8 plus E8 has signature 16. So one thing that Rahlin's theorem shows, for example, is that E8 cannot appear as the intersection form of such a manifold, at least if the manifold is smooth. Whereas it doesn't yet um, say whether E8 plus E8 can appear. That has signature divisible by 16. Okay, let's now talk about the H cobordism theorem. This, is, this was not something in dimension four, but it was something that was really fundamental to a manifold topology. And I will explain what it says in dimension four. An H cobordism between two closed n dimensional manifolds is a, a compact n plus one dimensional manifold with two boundaries. On one side you have y0 and on the other side you have y1. Everything is oriented, so um, yeah, so it should be minus y0 union y1. And furthermore, I want the inclusions of each boundary into the cobordism to be homotopy equivalences. So um, Smale in dimensions greater or equal than five proved the H cobordism theorem that every H cobordism between simply connected manifolds is a product. And therefore, if two such manifolds are related by an H cobordism, then they are diffeomorphic. So um, I was deliberately vague here. I mean, you can prove this theorem in the smooth case for smooth cobordisms, and then you get that the manifolds are diffeomorphic or you can prove it in the topological case and you get that the manifolds are homeomorphic. One consequence, one important consequence of, uh, of this is the n-dimensional Poincaré conjecture, again for n greater or equal than five, uh, which is that if an n-manifold is homotopy equivalent to Sn, then it must be homeomorphic to Sn, to the n-dimensional sphere. Now in dimension four, the usual proof of the H cobordism uh, due to smell doesn't work. Um, there is a final step which involves the Whitney trick of canceling disks. And you want to make sure that basically you can um, keep two dimensional disks apart. And in dimension at least five, you have two plus two is less than five. So by transversality, you can perturb the disks to not intersect. These are some disks, some Whitney disks that you have to use in, uh, in the proof of the H cobordism. In dimension four, there is still something. So there is uh, a result of Wall from 1964, which tells you that um, if you have two simply connected, smooth oriented four manifolds and uh, they have um, isomorphic intersection forms, then they are H cobordant. And furthermore, they become diffeomorphic after taking connected sums with enough copies of S2 times S2. So this is called stable diffeomorphism. So H cobordant implies stable diffeomorphism. And uh, this, is, this property is determined by the intersection form, just like the, uh, basically by the homotopy type. Okay, so for this, there's an other question. Yes. Okay. Carl Heinz? I cannot hear you. Sorry, I, I cannot hear the question. 
I think we should just move go on. on because otherwise okay, we don't yes. have time. Yes. Okay, let's move on. All right, so this, this raises the question uh, in the higher dimensions, H cobordism implied the smooth four dimensional uh, conjecture. Uh, actually, let me make a suggestion. So if you have questions, please write them in the Q&A uh, and then I can, um, I can see them. Can I see them? Okay. Um, all right, let, let's move on. Um, if um, X is homotopy equivalent to S4, is it diffeomorphic to S4? And that is still open. So this is the smooth Poincaré conjecture in dimension four. I will uh, talk about some strategies later. Uh, I should say that among experts, opinions are split when, whether this is true or false. In fact, I think most people just say they don't know, they have no idea. Um, over time, many potential counterexamples have been proposed, like manifolds that are homotopy equivalent to S4, but are not known to be diffeomorphic to it. So a, a, a big family comes from what's called the Gluck twist. Uh, so this was from 1962. The construction was to take an embedded sphere S2 in S4, um, which can be knotted. This is called a two knot, just like S1s can be knotted in S3, S2s can be knotted in S4, and then glue it back by this diffeomorphism uh, that I wrote here. And this gives something that's homotopy equivalent to S4, but it's not known to be, I mean, in general, for some knots, for some two knots, it's known to be diffeomorphic, and for others, it's not. And there are some other examples, like there's a famous family due to Capel, Shaneson from 1976. So these are other examples of interesting four manifolds. And some of these were later shown to be standard S4s. And right, so the more of these examples are known to be just diffeomorphic to S4, the more people get more confident that maybe the conjecture is true, but it may still be false. One other thing from before 1981 is uh, how do people uh, actually visualize four manifolds? Well, one way is by this uh, Kirby calculus, which was developed by Kirby in 1978. And um, this is based on Moore's theory on decomposing manifolds into handles. Uh, in general, Moore's theory tells you that any manifold can be decomposed into handles. In dimension four, um, you, you draw the attaching spheres, like you draw where the handles of the one handles and the two handles are attached. And that gives you what's called the Kirby diagram. I'm not gonna give the definition, but here's a typical picture for uh, an interval times the three torus. It's some collection of spheres in R3. These are the uh, attaching spheres for the one handles and then some link, which is some collection of arcs between the spheres, and those are um, representing the two handles. And this shows that four manifolds are very closely related to knots and links. And later we will, I will mention some relations uh, to knot theory. Um, Kirby calculus also consists not just of these diagrams, but of ways of saying when two four manifolds are related, uh, uh, when two diagrams represent the same four manifold, Namely, they do if and only if they are related by a sequence of certain moves called handle cancellations and handle slides. All right, let's go on to uh, the second part of the talk, uh, which um, is about the work of Friedman and Donaldson and then some applications. So in 1981, uh, I think this was published in 1982, but um, it's, it was proved in 1981, Michael Friedman proved the topological edge cobordism theorem in dimension four. So he proved that if you have a edge cobordism between four manifolds M and N simply connected, then um, topologically, meaning up to homeomorphism, the um, uh, H cobordism is a product and therefore the manifolds are homeomorphic. And a corollary is that four dimensional topological Poincare conjecture. 
if a manifold is homotopy equivalent to S4, then it is homeomorphic to S4. Okay, we still don't know the smooth version, but the topological version is true in dimension four, as we, now we know that it's actually true in all dimensions. Uh, more generally, so he gave a classification for simply connected closed topological four manifolds up to homeomorphism. So here is his um, theorem. Um, for every unimodular symmetric bilinear form Q, there exists a topological four manifold with that simply connected closed topological four manifold with that intersection form. If Q is even, then this is unique. So basically homotopy equivalence and homeomorphism are the same in that case. If the form is odd, then there's two homeomorphism types. They are, they are distinguished by another invariant called the kirby zibermann invariant. And if that invariant is non-trivial, then the manifold is not smooth. So at least you know for sure that um, at most one of them is smoothable out of these forms. But basically, uh, so again, intersection form determines homeomorphism plus this extra uh, ambiguity uh, if Q is odd. Um, so for example, uh, E8, remember by Rochlin's theorem, this is not an intersection form for um, um, for uh, a smooth four manifold, but by Friedman's result, it is an intersection. It, it is um, realized by a topological four manifold, which we can call ME8. As a consequence of this theorem, simply connected smooth four manifolds are determined up to homeomorphism by their intersection forms. So in the case of QR, one of them is for sure not smoothable. If you just look at smooth manifolds up to homeomorphism, then the intersection form tells you everything. So homotopy equivalence and homeomorphism are the same notion in this case. Okay, now at the same time as Friedman was doing uh, this, um, there was something else getting developed, namely gauge theory. Uh, gauge theory came from particle physics, namely uh, the differential equations that underlie electromagnetic interactions, weak and strong interactions in particle physics. For, for example, even in the electromagnetic case, Maxwell's equations, they admit gauge symmetry. So that's an infinite dimensional symmetry, meaning that they are written in terms of um, connections or sections of some vector bundle. And uh, the equations are symmetric under the automorphisms of that vector bundle. So that's called the gauge group. For example, if the bundle is trivial, let's say you have an SU2 bundle, then the gauge group is just functions from X, from the manifold to SU2. And that's an infinite dimensional group. And this is the symmetry of, uh, of the equations you have. The main example are the Yang-Mills equations. So these are for a connection in a SU2 bundle over the four manifold. Um, you look at, um, yeah, the, they take the form dA star fA equals zero. And in particular, uh, you can, I mean, this is a second order equation. You can study a first order equation, which gives uh, one type of solutions to these equations. They're called ASD, anti-self dual. Star of the curvature of A is minus the curvature of A. So these were important. They have motivation from physics. And in the 70s, mathematicians started paying attention to them and studying them from a mathematical point of view. For example, there was the ADHM, Atia Dringhold Hitchin Manin uh, description of the, so the ASD solutions on the four sphere. Okay, 
um, in the early 80s, there were two major results of analytical results about um, ASD connections, namely Uhlenbeck proved a compactness theorem and Taubes proved an existence theorem, um, like a grafting theorem. So you have the solutions on S4 and if you show that from them, you can construct solutions on any four manifold by grafting the ones on S4 onto your four manifold. And using their work, Donaldson studied the moduli space of ASD connections on a definite four manifold. So four manifold with definite intersection form and gave the first remarkable topological application of gauge theory. And this is his celebrated diagonalizability theorem from 1982, which says that if the intersection form of a smooth, simply connected closed four manifold is negative definite, then it is just a direct sum of copies of minus one. In other words, it's diagonal. So for smooth, uh, negative smooth definite forms mean actually diagonal forms. Uh, this means that, for example, E8, E8 is a definite form that's not diagonal and Donaldson's theorem shows that it cannot um, be realized as uh, the intersection form of a smooth four manifold. But we already knew that from Rochlin's theorem because the signature is uh, not divisible by 16. On the other hand, this also applies to forms like E8 plus E8, and that one is also not, uh, uh, not smooth. So for example, if you take Friedman's manifold ME8 and take its, the connected sum with itself, then that has um, signature 16, in principle, it's, um, yeah, the Rocklin doesn't uh, prevent it from being the intersection form of something smooth, but Donaldson's uh, theorem does. So this is not smoothable either. I phrased it in terms of negative definite, but of course it uh, this tells you the same thing about positive definite by just changing the orientation. Okay, so that's uh, quite interesting because it's, uh, it was the first kind of result in topology that was proved uh, using um, moduli spaces of uh, this uh, kind of gauge invariant equations. What were some applications uh, by combining uh, the work of Friedman and Donaldson? Well, one thing that mathematicians almost immediately realized was the existence of an exotic smooth structure on R4. Roughly the way this works, I mean, there are many different constructions, but here's one construction. You look at the connected sum of one copy of CP2 and nine copies of CP2, the complex projective space with the opposite orientation. This, is, this has this intersection form, one plus nine copies of minus one. Um, and that's, um, you can also write it as minus E8 plus minus one plus one. If you look at this last one in the last decomposition, the generator, it cannot be represented by a smoothly embedded sphere because if it did, you can kind of take it out and you would get a manifold with intersection for minus E8 plus minus one. And that's impossible. I mean, it would be smooth, but minus E8 plus minus one is not diagonal. Um, so it's not represented by a smooth embedded sphere, but using Friedman's work, you can show that it's represented by a topological um, um, sphere, namely one coming out of what's called the Casson handle. And a neighborhood of this sphere, you can embed it in CP2. It, you can think of it as some sort of CP1 inside CP2, but a non-smooth CP1, um, but it still has self-intersection one. And its complement turns out to be homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic to R4. And that's, uh, I mean, it has a smooth structure coming from it being a subset of CP2, but you can show using Donaldson's theorem that it's not diffeomorphic to R4. This result was later improved. So GOMP 
proved that R4 has infinitely many smooth structures, and then Taub's proved that it actually has uncountably many. Uh, and this should be contrasted with what happens in any other dimension. In any other dimension, Rn has a unique smooth structure, but in dimension four, it has uncountably many. Okay, this was mostly about, so far I just mentioned definite four manifolds. Uh, of course, there's also lots of them that are indefinite, that have indefinite forms. And for those, you can define um, polynomial invariance by counting, um, basically by counting solutions to the um, ASD equations. Uh, this was done by Donaldson. Uh, he defined these homogeneous polynomial functions from the uh, second uh, cohomology of X to R of some degree. These are now called Donaldson invariants. Uh, they're defined for B2 plus at least three and odd. And also for B2 plus equals one, but in that case they have a more, I mean, there's several such invariants and they, um, they are related by some formulas called wall crossing. So the, the form is a little bit more complicated, but um, still, you, you define some new invariants, and these are, um, they basically count solutions to, differ, to these differential equations, and therefore they depend on the, I mean, they really use in the definition the smooth structure on the manifold. In fact, they use a Riemannian metric, but in the end, it turns out they're not, um, they, they do not depend on the Riemannian metric, but they do depend on the smooth structure. Here are some properties of these invariants. Um, well, we have um, um, the invariants are zero when the manifold is um, a connected sum and each piece has non-trivial B2 plus. On the other hand, we also have a non-vanishing theorem for complex projective surfaces. Um, the invariance in that case can be understood in terms of algebraic geometry, in terms of counts of stable vector bundles. And you can show that in some, for some degrees, they do not vanish. Then there's also some formula relating the invariance of X and its blow up, X plus CP2 bar. This is a connected sum, uh, but B2 plus of CP2 bar is zero. So this, in that case, they do not vanish, but rather there's a relation between them. In fact, if they don't vanish for one, they also don't vanish for the other. And then there's, there's some structural results, um, recurrence relation that um, tell you how QD uh, behave uh, for different Ds for the same X. These were proved by Kronheimer and Brovka in 1994, assuming that the manifold is uh, what's called of simple type and um, basically all known examples out of this type. Here are some up more topological applications. Um, so this is for non, uh, for indefinite forms. Like we can look at CP2 plus nine CP2 bar. Donaldson proved that this and the Dolgachev surface, which is some other complex surface, which has the same intersection form. So uh, by uh, Friedman's results and Wall, um, we know that they are homotopy equivalent, h coordinate homeomorphic manifolds, but by, by uh, computing their invariance, Donaldson showed that they are not diffeomorphic. And therefore, uh, from here, he concluded that the smooth h cobordism theorem fails in dimension four, whereas it is true in higher dimensions. And it is also true topologically by the work of Friedman. There were many other examples of complex surfaces that, so apart from CP2 plus nine CP2 bar, um, people started studying complex surfaces and their uh, exotic smooth structures. They show that they exist, for example, on the K3 surfaces, on many surfaces of general type. And maybe the simplest examples, which were known at the time to have exotic smooth structures were uh, CP2 blown up at n points for n at least eight. This was uh, following work of Friedman and Morgan and Okonek and Van de Ven, and then Kochik did uh, 
I think this case with n equals eight. Another cool application was the fact that uh, irreducible simply connected four manifolds need not be complex. So as I said in the beginning, many of the examples that people knew of um, simply connected four manifolds came from complex or algebraic geometry. Um, well, not all of them like S4, but um, apart from that, uh, if you look at irreducible ones, those that cannot be decomposed as connected sums, people mostly knew examples from complex geometry. So Gumpf and Broca did something else. They started with a K3 surface and did some gluing, did some uh, log transforms in different places, and they found an example that um, well, that did not have a complex structure by looking at the ASD equations. So this showed that four-dimensional topology is more rich than just complex geometry, even for simply connected irreducible manifolds. And another interesting result was that this smooth versus topological distinction, you can even see it on compact contractible four manifolds. If you look at four manifolds with boundary, even the simplest ones um, where, which, that, which are contractible, there exist such uh, manifolds called quarks that have uh, an involution on the boundary, which, is, which extends to a self-homeomorphism of the manifold inside, but not to a self-diffeomorphism. In other words, this is an exotic structure relative to the boundary. Uh, this is uh, this this kind of example was found by Agbulut, and it's called Agbulut quarks. Um, Curtis Friedman, Shank Stong, and then Matveev, uh, they proved an interesting um, result that the failure of the H cobordism theorem is always due to the presence of such quarks in the H cobordism. So if you have an H cobordism, it's kind of the identity apart from some quarks. So it's always, it always boils down to these examples. And uh, that's why people, even nowadays, th that this is an active area of re research to study uh, quarks, like how many, for example, what the boundaries can be and to construct such examples. Apart from four-dimensional manifolds, four-dimensional topology also uh, is interested in uh, surfaces in four manifolds. Uh, and uh, a question is if you have a given homology class, you can, well, you can always represent it by a surface, by a smoothly embedded surface, but not always by a sphere. So you can ask what's the minimal genus for such um, a homology class. The question that was addressed by Kronheimer and Rovka in 1993 by studying uh, the ASD equations on four manifolds with and put, making some singularity along the surface for the instantons, they produced genus bounds for the surfaces in those manifolds that have uh, non-trivial Donaldson invariants. So an example is the K3 surface. And in that surface, they could prove the following, that smooth complex curves are genus minimizing in their homology class in the K3 surface. Later, it was proved in every complex surface, but for now, from Yang-Mills theory, they proved this result. Um, this had an interesting corollary, the local Tom conjecture, which says that algebraic curves in C2, okay, the K3 surface, maybe it looks complicated, but in C2, you can just look at affine algebraic curves and you can prove that they are locally genus minimizing. So if you intersect them with a ball, then if you fix the boundary of their intersection, every other smooth surface would have genus at least as much as the algebraic curve that you have. Okay. Um, so now we are, uh, Let's talk a little bit about embedded surfaces with boundary and make a connection to knot theory. Given a knot in the three-dimensional sphere, we can ask about its slice genus. Uh, the, 
Yes. Uh, the, the slice genus of a knot is the minimal genus of a surface with boundary the knot. The surface has to live in the four dimensional ball and intersect and it be properly, smoothly, properly embedded in the four dimensional ball. And on the boundary, it should be the knot. So every knot bounds such a surface. If the surface is a disk, if it's of genus zero, then the knot is called slice. And in general, you can talk about the minimal um, genus. This is called the slice genus. And it's an interesting quantity associated to the knot, but there is no known algorithm for computing the slice genus. So, and actually computing it for specific knots remains an active area of research. Um, let's see what we get out of the local thumb conjecture. Well, you can look at, a, uh, family of knots um, called the torus knots, TPQ. These are the intersection of um, the three sphere in C2 with this algebraic curve given by x to the p minus y to the q equals zero, or if you want it to be smooth, let's say equals epsilon. So these are knots inside S3 and they bound an algebraic curve inside the ball. The local time conjecture proved by kronheimer murovka says that this is the one of minimal genus. So the slice genus is actually given by the genus of this algebraic curve, which you can compute and you get that it's P minus one times Q minus one over two. And the fact that the slice genus is equal for torus knots is equal to this. This was uh, previously conjectured by Milner and then it was proved by, no, by Kronheimer and Rovka using yang mills theory in 1993. Okay, we'll come back to questions about knots later. I think we're uh, halfway through the talk. Great, yes. And um, we're ready to go to the next chapter, which is uh, cyborg wooden theory. Okay, so, uh, okay. I, I, I realized one thing, by the way, I cannot see the Q and A. Um, yes, I cannot see the Q&A while I'm doing the full screen. So maybe it's better if uh, people write it in the chat if they have questions and then I can decide what, what questions I can answer. Sorry about that. Okay, what was cyborg wind theory? Uh, it, it also came from physics. So in 1994, cyborg and introduced a new set of gauge invariant equations. Um, I mean, they're related to the Yang-Mills equations um, by something called S-duality, but instead of SU2 bundles, they are for uh, U1 bundles, namely they are equations for a connection in a U1 bundle uh, and also a spinner. Uh, phi, these are the equations. Oh, I changed notation from capital phi to lowercase phi, but Roughly, that's what they are. They, they involve the Dirac operator, and then the self-dual part of the curvature should be some quadratic form sigma in terms of P. Uh, let me just mention their main properties. The moduli space of solutions to cyborg wooden equations, which are also called monopoles, is compact. Uh, for the Yang-Mills, you had to compactify it by adding some bubbles, um, but here it's just compact and that makes it easier to count solutions and it makes, it, it makes the analysis easier. By counting solutions of these equations, you get what are called the cyborg wind invariants of four manifolds. They depend on the choice of a spin C structure on your manifold. Uh, which you can think of if you want as a, roughly a second cohomology class on your manifold. And just like the Donaldson invariant, they are defined when B2 plus is odd and at least three. And then when it's one, they're also defined, but you get two different invariants related by a wall crossing formula. In fact, they are really a repackaging or they're meant to be a repackaging of the Donaldson invariants. This is Wynn's conjecture, which is uh, which was the subject of work by Fihan and Linnaeus. So in a sense, they have the same information, but they are easier to work with. They're easier to compute and the analysis is easier. 
And also, as we shall see, by studying the cyborg Witten equations, you get some, uh, some other results coming from this compactness. What were some applications that came out of cyborg Witten theory? Well, first of all, many of the results uh, with, that you could prove with Yang Mills, you can reprove with cyborg Witten theory. For example, Donaldson's theorem, if you want. Um, and well, interestingly, some can be improved. So for example, Kronhammer and Rovka uh, proved the thumb conjecture. They proved that smooth algebraic curves in CP2 are genus minimizing in their homology class. So before we had it in K3 and in C2 and, yeah, and in some other algebraic surfaces, but now you can prove it, for example, in the simplest complex projective surface, namely CP2. And you have this, um, well, you have a specific formula in the, in D, in the class D times the generator. Uh, the minimal genus of a smooth uh, surface is D minus one times D minus two over two. This was called the thumb conjecture. One other important work was that of Taubes who studied the cyborg Witten equations on symplectic manifolds. Uh, the Yang-Mills equations were previously studied mostly on complex manifolds, but people didn't know how to deal with the symplectic case, which is more general. The cyborg Witten equations, you can understand them very well on symplectic manifolds. You can show that they do not vanish uh, for the canonical, I mean, the invariants don't vanish um, for the canonical class. And uh, in fact, you can express the cyborg Witten invariants in terms of the gromov Witten invariants in symplectic geometry, which are counts of pseudo holomorphic curves. And this led to a lot of interesting applications in symplectic geometry. Um, so Taubes proved a famous result that um, CP2 has a unique symplectic structure. Uh, this was generalized to other uh, um, symplectic four manifolds like S2 bundles over compact surfaces. Lalonde and McDuff classified all symplectic manifolds uh, with this diffeomorphism type. Sabo in 1996, prove that there exist simply connected irreducible four manifolds that are not symplectic. Again, using the cyborg Witten invariants, just like Gumpf and Rovka showed that uh, there are such manifolds that are not complex. He showed that there are also some that are not symplectic. So four dimensional topology is more complicated than just symplectic four manifolds. And Orschwart and Sabo proved a general symplectic thumb conjecture, which says that symplectic surfaces in symplectic manifolds are genus minimizing in their homology class. So uh, from cyborg Witten, you could get it more easily that this is true uh, for complex surfaces in let's say complex projective manifolds, but using Taubes' work, you can generalize these to symplectic surfaces in symplectic manifolds. These are also genus minimizing in their homology class. Uh, okay, there were, uh, here's an interesting uh, construction of four manifolds that was introduced by Fintuschel and Stern in 1996 and shows the richness of four dimensional topology. If you have a uh, simply connected smooth four manifold, let's say B2 plus greater than one, and you have a torus with certain properties, I'm not gonna say what they are, these are called C embedded tori, but they exist in many complex surfaces. For example, in the K3 surface, you can find something like this. It's a torus with self-intersection zero in a non-trivial homology class, and it has uh, one other property. Then you can, uh, okay, let me, uh, let me get to the next line first. You can construct a new manifold, XK, which is X minus a neighborhood of this torus. And then you put back in S1, 
times the neighborhood, uh, times the complement of a knot in S3. So the complement of a knot in S3 has boundary T2. If you take a product with S1, you get something with boundary T3. And you can add it to X minus these torus. You get a new four manifold. And you can show it's homeomorphic to X. And you can ask if it's diffeomorphic. Well, you can compute a cyborg Witten invariance. There is this formula that the cyborg Witten invariance of XK are those of X times when the Alexander polynomial of the knot. Uh, this is some classical invariant associated to knots. I should mention, so I'm, here I'm writing the cyborg Witten invariance as a power series in terms of the characteristic classes of the spin C structure. You can make a formal power series and then you have this nice form, you can write this nice formula in terms of um, the cyborg Witten um, series and um, um, Alexander polynomials. What this tells you is that, for example, for the K3 surface, their cyborg Witten is just one, the series. And then by doing this construction, you can get any Alexander polynomial. And this can be basically any symmetric polynomial with a delta of one equals one. So you can get uh, a lot of things. You get from here a lot of exotic smooth structures on the K3 surface. And you can show that many of them are not symplectic. One open question, it might be that actually K almost determines the diffeomorphism type of XK. This is not known. It could be just um, that, I mean, we just know that if two knots have different Alexander polynomials, then um, the corresponding XKs are not diffeomorphic, even though they are homeomorphic. Uh, but okay, it's known that if you have a knot and it's mirrored, then they give the same XK. But it might be that apart from that, the knot pretty much determines XK. If that were true, then that would mean that even for simply connected four manifolds, like all this XK, four dimensional topology is at least as complicated as, as knot theory. And knots really does no nice classification scheme. You just have a family of knots and then you kind of expect that the same is true for four dimensional simply connected four manifolds. Okay, here is a result that came out of cyborg Witten theory that doesn't use the invariance directly, but uses the uh, structure of the cyborg Witten map. This is called Furuta's 10 8 theorem. And it uses a symmetry of the cyborg Witten equation that appears in the presence of a spin structure. So that's when the intersection form is even. Let's say the manifold is still simply connected. Then you can prove that the cyborg Witten have this symmetry under a group called P2. It's a sub uh, set of the quaternions made of two circles. And um, right, S1 is basically constant gauge transformation in our U1 bundle. And J is called the conjugation symmetry from the spin structure. So Furuta showed that the cyborg Witten map, meaning the one that gives the cyborg Witten equations, like it takes A phi to Dirac of phi and then some f plus a minus sigma phi. This is a map between infinite dimensional spaces, but you can approximate it by some map between finite dimensional spheres with a pin to action. And they need to have some properties with respect to their fixed point sets. And just the existence of these maps, of this map between spheres between, that has these equivariance properties you can use some algebraic topology like equivariant K theory and deduce an inequality about uh, the second Betty number and the signature of the four manifold. So what he proved is that if you have a spin closed four manifold smooth and if the intersection form is not definite, then B2 is at least 10 eighths times the signature plus two. This restricts which intersection forms appear as, um, I mean, sorry, which bilinear forms appear as intersection forms for smooth four manifolds. Uh, this, we, we are in the indefinite case where everything has to be a connected sum of 0, 1, 1, 0 and the number of copies of E8. And this tells you an inequality between how many copies of each kind you can have. 
So it gives you this constraint. Uh, it's some progress. So really what you would like to prove is this 11 eighths conjecture due to Matsumoto, which is that B2 is greater or equal than 11 eighths times sigma. This is what has been observed in practice for all known four manifolds. They satisfied, I mean, with spin and intersection form even indefinite, they satisfied this inequality. If it's proved, then you would know exactly which intersection forms appear for smooth manifolds. And combined with Donaldson's theorem, you would basically complete the classification of smooth, simply connected four manifolds up to homeomorphism. So recall up to homeomorphism, they're determined by their intersection form. And the only question is what forms can appear. So this uh, conjecture would tell you which intersection forms can appear. Um, yeah, and um, that would do that. Of course, what you really want is the classification up to diffeomorphism. That's much harder, less is known about that, but uh, this is the best result we have towards the classification um, up to homeomorphism. Okay, now we're uh, on the last 20 years. So this is the fourth part of the talk, starting in 2000. What happened since we talked about Furuta's uh, result on the, last slide, on the last slide, let me also mention some other results from uh, finite dimensional approximation. You can use it to give better invariants than the cyborg Witten invariants. These are called the Bauer-Furuta invariants. And instead of being numbers, they are elements in a pin two equivariant stable homotopy groups of spheres. So you can think of the cyborg Witten invariants as maybe counting points. They're homological, in, they're, they capture some homological information. These ones capture stable homotopy information. In other words, they look at the moduli space as a framed manifold. And via the Pontryagin tom construction, you get an element in the stable homotopy group of spheres. And these contain more information. For example, they're non-trivial for, man they can be non-trivial for manifolds with B2 plus even, such as K3 plus K3. Whereas the cyborg Witten and Donaldson invariants vanish for such manifolds. And therefore you can start studying like exotic smooth structures on connected sums of the K3 surface. And Bauer proved that uh, such um, exotic smooth structures exist if you take up to four copies of K3. It's not known for more copies of K3. And in a different direction, also coming from finite dimensional approximation, Furuta's 10 8 inequality was improved, uh, I mean, by Hopkins, Lin, Shi, and Xu uh, in 2018. Uh, it was improved by a constant term. So it's still 10 eights, but plus four or something depending on uh, the Betty number mod eight, I think. Um, so, uh, and that's actually the best result that you can presumably get out of cyber Witten theory because these people did some serious algebraic topology and they characterize exactly what P to equivariant maps with the given properties uh, exist. So from cyborg Witten theory, you get a pin to equivariant map with some properties and algebraic topology tells you exactly what, when they exist and they get this uh, slightly improved 10 8 inequality. The 11 8 conjecture is still open. Okay, what I wanna talk about most is FLIR homology, but before I do that, let me just mention some other interesting developments in four manifolds in the last 20 years. Uh, some highlights, various. Uh, so one of them was the existence of infinitely many exotic smooth structures on relatively small, simply connected four manifolds, namely CP2 blown up at end points with N at least two. With yang mills theory, if you remember, I mentioned it was known for n at least eight. Uh, this was brought, the number was brought down by uh, John Gill Park, n equals seven. And then in a few years, there was a rush of research. Um, Stipschitz, Sabo, Fintuschel, Stern, and Ahmed of Park. In the end, they brought it down to CP2 plus two CP2 bar. And it's still not known if 
CP2 plus one copy of CP2 bar, or even better, CP2 has an exotic smooth structure. Um, okay, what else? In symplectic geometry, there was a cool result about which manifolds of the form a three manifold times S1 are symplectic. And it's not hard to show that if the three manifold fibers over S1, then um, M times S1 is symplectic, but the implication in the other direction was um, a conjecture for a long time and it was finally proved by Friedel and Viducci in 2008. What else? Uh, by the way, I'm, having, I'm hearing some echo. I don't know if uh, uh, anyone can do anything about that, like the organizers. I think that may be bong if we can just have all the panelists mute. Okay, please do that, yeah. Okay, uh, what else? We had all these counter examples to the potential counter example to the smooth point or echo contraction in dimension four. And there was uh, um, a big development in 2009 when Agbulut and then later Gomf were um, proved that a lot of the, the examples that were people hoped to not be S4 were actually S4. So they gave some topological construction and this made people more confident in towards the positive direction that maybe SPC4 is actually true. Here are some recent results. Gabai proved an exciting topological result, the four dimensional light bulb theorem. If you have a two sphere in S2 times S2 in the homology class of one copy of S2 and it intersects the other S2 in exactly one point transversely, then it is isotopic to this other S2, to, to, the, to one of the S2s. So this is, uh, yeah, this is a, uh, um, a four dimensional version of a well-known result in three dimensions called the light bulb theorem. And it was proved just using pure topology, no gauge theory or anything. And Watanabe uh, in 2018, uh, this proved the four dimensional smell conjecture, which said that the diffeomorphism group of S4 is homotopy equivalent to O5. He found um, elements in the homotopy groups of um, BDF S4, showing that it is not homotopy equivalent to O5. Okay, so this is just some, a few highlights of four dimensional topology from the last 20 years. Um, what I want to focus on is FLIR homology, which is, which is really became a very active area. Uh, this is about, instead of studying closed four manifolds, which are getting kind of hard, well, it's just hard to say anything beyond what was done, the cyborg written in, uh, theory in the first few years, uh, you can look at four manifolds with boundary. So for four manifolds with boundary, the whatever invariants you have, Donaldson or cyborg Witten, instead of being numbers, now they are element in a group associated, in an abelian group associated to the boundary, which is called the FLIR homology of the three manifold. And there are different versions of FLIR homology. The main idea or motivation for this is that you want to calculate the four dimensional invariants by cut and paste techniques. So if you understand the, the invariants for manifolds with boundary, you can glue them together. You can split the manifold into simple plate pieces, hopefully. And then you should have some um, gluing formula of the form that the invariant, whatever it is, cyborg Witten or Donaldson of X is a pairing between the invariants of the two pieces in the flow homology of, uh, of the manifold Y of the three manifold along which you glue. So the first such Fleur homology was constructed by Fleur in 1988. So that was using the Yang-Mills equations and this gave a gluing formula for the Donaldson invariants. And, but this was just for homology three spheres. So manifolds with uh, uh, the homology of S3. Since then, many other Fleur homologies were developed. 
uh, for three manifolds. And then there's also versions for knots inside three manifolds. Um, there's instant on homology was developed to other uh, three manifolds by uh, Freushov, Kronheimer, and Mrovka. They got more structure on it, equivariant structure. Um, Miller, and also for knots by Daemi and Scaduto last year. Uh, then for the cyborg written equations gave rise to monopole flair homology. There is a book by Kronheimer and Mrovka in 2007, which discusses uh, every, yeah, a, a general theory for all three manifolds. In particular cases, there were like for rational homology spheres, there was previous work of Marcoli Wang and myself and Freushov. And then there's also a theory for knots. So there are several theories for flair homologies for knots like developed by uh, for example, Zhen Kun Li and um, Dong Hao Wang recently. Hegart flair homology is a new theory. I'll say more about it in the next slide. It was developed by Oshvat Sabo. And then for knots, there's something called knot flair homology developed by Oshvat Sabo and independently Rasmussen. And the last two, monopole and Hegart flair, are actually now known to be isomorphic by the work of Kutluhan, Li Taubes, and Kolangi Gini Honda. So Hegart flood in a sense is the same as cyborg Windsor homology, but uh, it was constructed by Oshvat and Savo using symplectic geometry, namely counts of pseudo holomorphic curves. It was meant to be a replacement for cyborg Witten theory and it's, uh, I mean, it has the same information, but it's easier to work with. It's more computationally tractable in fact, soon after they developed it, Hoshvat and Sabo also gave concrete formulas for uh, this invariant for many families of three-dimensional manifolds like plumbings and Seifert vibrations, and also for surgeries on knots. So if you have a knot in just, let's say in S3, you can take out a neighborhood and then put back in some other solid torus. This is called surgery on knot and well, every three manifold can be obtained by surgery on a bunch of knots on a link. And there are formulas relating the flood homology of the knot or of the link with the flood homology of the uh, three manifold. So this way you can compute it for uh, many surgeries on simple knots. And there are concrete formulas for the flood homology for many families of knots like alternating or torus knots. And using the surgery formulas, you get formulas for HF of surgeries on such knots. In fact, there are actually, uh, there are algorithms to compute knot flood homology for any knot. And that's, I mean, there are, there are what's called combinatorial descriptions. So without symplectic geometry, um, and that makes this algorithmically computable. The first one was given by myself with Oshvat and Sharkar in 2006. And then there were other uh, different uh, descriptions uh, by Oshvat Sabo, Baldwin Levine and others. Uh, this led to co uh, combinatorial descriptions also of Hegart flair homology itself for three manifolds. Um, one version of it was done by Sharkar and Wang in 2006. And then with Oshvat and Thurston, we did all the different versions for three manifolds. And we also gave um, um, combinatorial description for the four manifold invariants, which are conjecturally the same as the cyber Witten invariants. Now this is a, an, a, a combinatorial description, but it's really not tractable for computing things. I mean, it's just the algorithm is very complicated. Recently, people uh, are also working on making more effective algorithms that you can actually implement on the computer and get calculations of flood homology or not flood homology. Um, the best ones come from this bordered flood homology, which, which is based on the idea of also cutting the three manifold into pieces and getting gluing formulas there. So getting versions for three manifolds with boundary. It was developed by Lipschitz, Oshvat, Thurston for three manifolds and uh, recently, Oshvat and Sabo are developing a version for knots. And with this, you can really compute it for many, many knots and three manifolds. In terms of applications, uh, so flood homology, I mean, mo mostly people develop new three-dimensional applications like questions about surgery, 
which kind of nodes give you which kind of three manifolds. There was property P for nodes, which was proved by Kronhammer and Mrovka. There was the surgery characterization of the unknot called Gordon's conjecture. And there was also applications to contact geometry. But I'm not gonna talk much about them because you know this is a talk about four dimensional manifolds. So let's see what they gave about, to, they gave in terms of four dimensional manifolds. And it, this is mostly about four dimensional manifolds with boundary. Just like for closed manifolds, we had Donaldson and Furuta gave constraints on the intersection forms of smooth four manifolds. You can extend this to smooth manifolds with boundary, uh, a specific three manifold, and there were results of this form given by Froeschow and Oshwat Sabo in terms of uh, Fleur homology. Recently, there has been even new calculations for closed four manifolds. Uh, so with cyborg within theory, for example, there was a variant of the fintuchel stern knot surgery called knot concordance surgery, which, for which people didn't know how to compute the, uh, the cyborg within invariants. But now with hegard fleur homology, using all these cut and paste results, there is such a formula due to Juhas and Zemke from 2018. So by now the theory has prog progressed to the stage where you can even apply to closed four manifolds and get new results. And here's a random other result about four manifolds with boundary. There exists manifolds with boundary homotopy equivalent to S2, but that, such that this equivalence is not realized by a piecewise linear embedding of S2 inside your X. So that's called the spine. And this is like a spineless um, four manifolds homotopy equivalent to S2. This was the existence of such things was proved by Levin and Liedmann, again, using hegard fleur homology. Um, okay, a simpler question about four manifolds with boundary is which three manifolds bound homology four balls? That's, um, Yes, that's the simplest kind of four manifold with boundary if it has trivial homology. Well, this can be captured by what's called the homology cobordism group. This is a group made out of homology spheres, Y, and two such Y are equivalent if they are related by uh, what's called the homology cobordism. So some four manifold such that the relative homology is zero. That looks homologically like a cylinder. And a three manifold is zero in this abelian group, if and only if it bounds a homology ball. But more generally, you want to understand what is this group, theta 3z. It's a group made out of three manifolds, but its structure has to do with four dimensional topology. The first thing known about this group is that it's non-trivial. This just comes out of Rochlin's theorem. You can show that it has an epimorphism to Z mod two given by, uh, you have a three manifold, you look at a four manifold, spin four manifold with boundary Y and divide by signature by eight ma two. You can show that this is an epimorphism uh, and this tells you that the group is non-trivial. Using Yang-Mills theory in the nineties, it was proved that the group has a Z infinity subgroup and later, uh, Froeschow initiated the study of some invariants, and there are versions of this from Yang Mills or from Cyborg Witten or from Hegard Flood. And well, with any of this method, you can show that there is an epimorphism to Z, which, which from here you can deduce that this group has a Z summoned. So having a summoned of a form of a certain form is uh, a stronger condition on the group than having a subgroup. For example, Q has a Z subgroup, but it doesn't have a Z summon. Uh, okay, so new results coming from Fleur homology. Uh, one result that I proved was that the Rahlin homomorphism doesn't split. So this exact sequence where mu is the Rahlin homomorphism doesn't split, which combined with older work of Kaluski Stern from Matsumoto from the 70s showed the existence of non-triangulable manifolds uh, in dimensions at least five. And the proof used a pin to equivariant version of cyborg wooden homology. 
Similar ideas uh, came in Hegard Fleur, I mean, uh, were developed in Hegard Fleur homology and Dye, Staffragan, Hamm, and Truong in 2018 proved a strong result about theta 3z itself. They showed that it, that it has a z infinity summoned. So with Yang Mills, it was known that it has a z infinity subgroup. Now uh, with Hegard Fleur, you can prove that it has a z infinity summoned. So more and more is known about this group. I mean, we get that it's pretty complicated, but we still don't really know what it is. Okay, so this was all uh, gauge theory and Hegard Fleur homology, which is a replacement for gauge theory for cyber wind theory. So in, in the end, it's all based on the invariants that were developed in the 80s and the 90s, the Yang Mills and the cyber wind theory. What I want to talk about in the last few minutes is a new type of invariant, which is called Kovano homology, which holds the promise of some new results. And this is just for knots in S3. So Kovanov defined this invariant, which has a simple combinatorial definition. You take a diagram of the knot and you consider what's called the cube of resolutions, all ways of resolving the crossing. Then you make some vector spaces associated to each loop in here, and you define some maps between these tensor products. I don't want to get into the definition, but it's, it's something like very simple and combinatorial. It doesn't use any differential equations. Uh, it's a homology theory. Its Euler characteristic is the Jones polynomial of the knot. And it was constructed combinatorially, this theory. It's closely connected to representation theory, but it's formally similar to Fleur homologies for knots. So it's functorial under knot cobordism in a cylinder. In other words, it has something to do with four dimensional topology, namely with surfaces in the cylinder. And as we shall see, it has some four dimensional applications. And this similarity to Fleur homology is more than just an analogy. Uh, Abu Zaid and Smith uh, proved a conjecture of Seidel Smith that Kovanov homology actually has an asymplectic interpretation in terms of Lagrangian Fleur homology. And it may also have a gauge theory interpretation. So Witten made a conjecture that Kovanov homology comes from some new gauge theoretic equations, the Kapustin, Witten, and Hadish Witten equations with some boundary conditions. So in principle, this is also some new version of gauge theory. Uh, I mean, Witten's conjecture hasn't yet been proved, but there's work in that direction due to Taubes and others. An open question is whether it can actually be extended to three manifolds. So, so far it's just for knots in S3 and cobordisms between them. But since it looks so much like Fleur homology, you might wonder if there's an actual theory for three manifolds and maybe for four manifolds. And that would give something new for four manifolds. Recently, there was a candidate due to Morris Walker Wedridge for four manifolds with boundary. It's unclear if this is the right thing or if it, um, if it can tell apart four manifolds, but there is some progress in this direction and we'll see where it takes us. Before, I mean, since we don't really understand the three-dimensional and four-dimensional extension, we can still get four-dimensional application of Kovano homology by just thinking about problems related to knots, but four-dimensional problem related to knots. And the typical example is what Rasmussen did in 2004. He defined some invariant of knots called K using Kovano homology and showed that it's a bound on the slice genus. So the slice genus, remember, it's what's the minimal genus of surfaces in B4 with boundary the knot. And he used this to give a new proof of Milner's conjecture about the slice genus of torus knots. If you remember, this was proved by Kronheimer and Murovka using um, Yang-Mills theory. Now there is also a proof with Kovano homology, which is just purely combinatorial. And based on this, uh, you can also prove the existence of exotic R4s using, uh, using uh, Kovano homology. It follows from the existence of topologically sliced knots that are not smoothly sliced. So those that bound topologically flat disks, but not smooth disks in B4. So you can prove 
yeah, that R4 has exotic smooth structures without gauge theory. Further, there was this, another thing you can prove with Kovanov homology is th the Tom conjecture about surfaces in CP2, uh, again, which was originally proved by Kronheimer and Morovka with gauge theory. Uh, the Kovanov homology proof is due to Lambert Co from 2018, and he used several ingredients apart from Kovanov homology. He used a new way of visualizing four manifolds in terms of trisections, which was due to Ker Gay and Kirby, and some contact geometry. But somehow it's interesting that he reduced surfaces in CP2 to something about knots in S3. So that's topological input, and then he used Kovanov homology to. Uh, to say something about knots and surfaces. All right, so Kovanov homology is making some inroads into four-dimensional topology. There's even the hope of that it would say something about a smooth Poincaré conjecture though in four dimensions. So there's a strategy due to Friedman, Gump, Morrison, and Walker that maybe you can find a knot that has S non-zero, which would mean that it doesn't bound the disk in B4, but by an explicit construction, you might be able to say that it bounds a disk in a homotopy ball. If so, then that homotopy ball would not be the usual ball, and by filling it up with another ball, you would get a non-trivial homotopy force field. So you would disprove the smooth ball for the Poincaré conjecture. Now, no such knots have been found, but people are looking for them. This is a strategy that is specific to Kovanov homology. So you couldn't do it with gauge theory because in gauge theory, you really don't see the difference between balls and homotopy balls. One thing that I proved with Marang on Sharkar and Willis last year was that this strategy fails for a large family of potential counterexamples, namely the ones obtained by Gluck twists on B4. So for those, the S invariant, if it bounds a disk in there, you can actually say that it's zero, just like in before. So you cannot tell the difference. And that's uh, some other result about basically how S behaves to, with respect to surfaces in interesting four manifolds like CP2. Okay, so the strategy might still work, but we know that it fails for a large class of potential counterexamples. And okay, then what about, so far I just talked about uh, what Kovanov homology could reprove. There are also some uh, things that it can prove that could not be proved with gauge theory or people didn't know how. First of all, there exist knots with S non-zero, but the gauge theoretic invariants vanish. So this is that they are not sliced. They do not bound balls in B4. The first examples were found by Hedden and Ording. And Livingstone used this to show something about the smooth concordance group of topologically sliced knots that it has a Z3 summon. Um, this is a group that's kind of like the homology cobordism group, but it's for knots. And people, again, don't know what it is. It kind of captures the topological versus smooth distinction for knots. And two other nice results uh, using Kovano homology were due to Lisa Picarillo from 2018. He showed that, the that there exists knots where the slice genus it is different from another quantity called the zero shake genus. And she also showed that a famous knot called the Conway knot is not sliced. Uh, she constructed a partner knot such that on the one hand, you can say that one is sliced if the other is sliced and the Rasmussen invariant of the partner is non-zero, which shows that the Conway knot is not sliced. So this was a knot that people didn't know how to prove that it's not sliced, and there's no known proof with gauge theory, but there is a proof with Kovanov homology. So my hope for the future is that Kovanov homology uh, could prove new results in, uh, of four-dimensional uh, type. All right, so that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much, Cyprian, for a wonderful overview. Um, in the webinar version, you can't unmute yourself and applause, um, but you can send Cyprian thoughts of uh, applause and thanks for his uh, excellent, excellent talk. Um, we don't have many minutes left. I think we have like uh, maybe one or two. Um, 
Chip, and if you stop sharing your screen, you okay, can look at the Q&A. Yes, you might be able to click on Q and, Q and answer and maybe pick, unfortunately, select a, a one or two questions, which you might have uh, one minute or so to, to answer before the, the next talk. Okay, yes. So, does Covano homology prove there are infinitely or uncountably many exotic smooth structures on R4? The answer is yes for infinitely many, but not for uncountably many. Um, is there an analog of Witten conjecture related in instant on flare homology and monopole flare homology? Not that I know of, maybe Peter knows, but uh, there is one conjecture about uh, the uh, framed version that they have the same rank, but uh, I think for the equivariant version, it's, it's unclear what that would be. Um, yes, there are applica other applications of the family Donaldson cyber Witten invariants. Yes, there are applications to uh, like some families are, there are smooth families that are topologically trivial, but not smoothly trivial. There, there were some, uh, there's some recent work by Kono and Baralia. Um, okay, I think maybe that's all I have time for. Wonderful. So on behalf of the panelists here, the audience out there, CMSA and Harvard, just like a thank you once more for excellent presentation. Um, and um, I will withdraw now and leave it to the next panelists to um, induce the, the next talk in, in the series. Thank you again, Cyprian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.